We're thinking of flying as the freedom of flying, the control, that we can go where we want to go. And that, that future is now within reach. This then gets to uh, what we'll call uh, flying vehicles. I know there's a technical term, EV tolls or whatever, but uh, this could be even uh, more of a breakthrough than, uh, than the autonomous automobile. Uh, tell us about the Jetsons and how yeah. uh, that uh, cartoon uh, of decades ago actually uh, foretold the future. <laughs> 1962 with the Jetsons is so amazing how popular culture kind of pre-guesses the great technology inventions long before they happened over and over again. Um, so the Jetsons had this beautiful flying saucer and, and it really freed them from traffic and gave an amazing capability. Um, fast forward 2020, we now have incredibly good battery technology uh, that allows us to build vehicles with many, many rotors, akin of like a drone-like person, a drone-like vehicle big enough to carry a person. Um, and those can now take off vertically very quietly, fly roughly 100 miles on a single charge and land again. And that's significant because there is a vision here that in the future, traffic will not be on the ground, but it'll be like 500 feet in the air. Why is that good? Well, for one, 500 feet in the air, you can go on a straight line. There's no trees in the way or buildings. So you have much more volume where you can navigate. And it could be uh, environmentally more friendly. The best vehicles we build today are roughly twice as good in terms of energy consumption than the best electric cars today. So I see a vision where cities will not have streets anymore, but they have small landing pads and we all use essentially, yeah, the Jetson technology. So uh, the flying vehicle is not uh, uh, wings on our automobile that sprout out. It's more, as you pointed out, like a helicopter. Uh, and uh, the amazing thing, the progress you've been making uh, is that one, it's noiseless, uh, like, like in a good electric, electric vehicle, and uh, in a sense more s far safer than a helicopter. I think you, uh, I, I, I'm going to get it wrong here, but there's a bolt in a helicopter, I guess they call it the Jesus bolt or something, where if it goes wrong, by golly, you're, you're, you're doomed. But uh, in the vehicles you have now, you have numerous little motors, and so in, uh, far, far safer than the traditional helicopter. Walk us through that. It, it, it's quite an amazing breakthrough. Yeah, Steve, that, that, thanks for saying this. We are still at the beginning of it, to be honest. We haven't established that it's really safer. But here's the reason why we should think uh, this technology would be better. Helicopters are actually great. And we would use them every day, all of us, if it wasn't for three reasons. Number one, they're really expensive. They're for rich people. Number two, they're insanely noisy. Most cities hate them. And number three, they're very, very unsafe. If you look at the safety record of helicopters, it's about the same as motorcycles. That's really, really bad. Um, the reason why this new technology can beat all these things, first, it's already shown to be quiet. It's electrically driven. So you don't have this noisy combustion engine. Um, number two, um, the costs of these vehicles are much, much lower. It turns out electromotors are much cheaper than gas turbines. And in terms of safety, these systems are highly redundant. The moment you go electric, it is completely conceivable that you have like 10 different lift bands as opposed to just one big uh, propeller for the helicopter. And if you lose one of those, you still have nine left and you're still perfectly safe. And that's what everyone in the industry does now. We, we build these highly redundant, highly distributed systems that can lift you up where you can lose a component or two and still fly around safely. And uh, the implications are profound. Uh, first of all, tell us about the loophole where you can uh, use these things uh, without getting a formal pilot's license because <laughs> you've made them so yeah, light I mean, now. <laughs> this is a little uh, funny aspect of, of American law um, when the FAA established the need for a pilot's license, which generally is a good thing. Um, it exempted vehicles that have a, a total weight of less than 254 pounds. I don't know where this number came from, but they're called ultra lightweights. Uh, and they became very popular in the 80s where people with any, no, no pilot training whatsoever got these little airplanes and then typically crashed and died back in the day. So it became popular and unpopular. But there is a loophole where you can actually um, legally fly uh, these vehicles without a pilot's license. What we've shown is at Kitty Hawk is that we can train you in an hour to be a proficient pilot. And why can we do this? Because it turns out the act of flying is actually very simple. It is basically lift up in the air, go forward and come down. It's actually easier than riding a bicycle. And that's something that's new. I think when, when we think of the dream of flying, like every boy's, every girl's dream, 
We don't think of flying as standing in line in the TSA and getting mediocre food in a cramped big jet. We're thinking of flying as the freedom of flying, the control, that we can go where we want to go. And that, that future is now within reach. Now, uh, one of the things, uh, the virtues of uh, the, these flying cars, so to speak, is the time that it saves. The amount of time we spend in traffic, especially if you live in California, but almost anywhere, uh, the, the time you spend in one of these flying vehicles is a fraction of getting to uh, point A, point, from point A to point B than you'd would in an automobile. Cuts our commuting time, no matter how long, by 90% or more. It's amazing yeah, yeah. the speeds these things can achieve. It's, it's really interesting when you, when you go up in the air, uh, our, we have a prototype we call Heavy Side. It's a, you can look at our website. It looks a bit like a plane, but it can, can land and take off vertically. And it flies at roughly 180 miles per hour um, on a straight line. So it means you go from uh, Manhattan to uh, JFK in like four minutes, right? Or you cross uh, Los Angeles in 15 minutes. And that's possible because uh, once you're up in the air, you just go on a straight line. In fact, if there's someone else in the air and you fear that there might be a conflict, let them fly a little bit higher and you're completely deconflicted at this moment. So you have this incredibly big volume. And that is going to be a game changer because, I mean, we spent weeks in, of a life cycle, maybe half a year and stuck in traffic and, and it's not getting any better. I mean, maybe COVID helped a little bit because people drive a little bit less, but once the pandemic is over, we're going to drive more and more and more and more and there's not going to be many any new roads. So with this new technology, we can turn the entire sky into a, into a highway. If, if you have a highway lane in the sky and say you want to double the capacity, we just recompile the software and add a few vertical layers to this virtual highway in the sky. And all of a sudden we have infinite capacity. Uh, when people ask, oh, we take all the traffic from the ground to the sky when we have the same traffic jams. No, we will not because we have the third dimension. We can go up, we can go sideways. Uh, that extra space will deconflict all the traffic problems we have today on the ground. So uh, uh, give us uh, the three myths that you've talked about that uh, people bring up about uh, flying in the air. Uh, let's start with myth number one, that it wastes energy. It does the opposite. Uh, to tell us about why that's a myth, that it could be an energy waster. Yes, yeah, so the intuition for anything flying is, wow, it's got to be hard to stay up in the air. That's true. So you, you will, every aircraft spends energy on staying up in the air. That's called lift, technical terms. It also spends energy on like moving forward, bouncing in all the air, air atoms. It's called drag. And typically, an, a, a modern airliner spends about 5 to 10% of energy on staying up, but 95% of the energy on, on moving forward. Uh, and that energy is basically the same as on the ground. In fact, it's slightly better if you're high up in the air. Um, so by, by going on a straight line, you can actually cut your distance by 15%. We, we drive 15% extra because we have to go zigzag along the way. So in totality, you should be able to fly more energy efficient than you, you're on the ground. I know this sounds like a physics lecture here. I, I condensed it, but take my word for it. The, the best vehicle we build, heavy side, when we actually measure the amount of energy per mile, it comes down to about 120 watt hours per mile. And that's about a third, half or a third of what a Tesla would use for the same distance at twice the speed. And that's, that's actually a proof that it's, it's, it's possible. Um, we really have proven that it's possible to be more energy efficient in the air than on the ground. Uh, another worry, which uh, you uh, alluded to, is that with all these vehicles flying around, it's going to be unsafe up there. We're going to be crashing into each other. But uh, you believe that there's software where uh, we're not going to have to worry about that. Automatically, we'll know, move up three feet, or move down three feet. Well, walk us through that. It's actually going to be safer than what we are on the ground. It's actually a great accomplishment of the FAA, the Federal Aviation uh, Authority. Uh, to have made the sky safe. And when you enter a jet and fly somewhere, you're being routed by air traffic control. And they use computers to reserve to you, to your jet um, that you're flying in, uh, at any point in time, a block of airspace that this plane then owns and, and is the only plane in there. And in doing so, it gets a guaranteed spatial separation of aircraft. And that's the reason, one of the many reasons why you don't crash into other aircraft anymore because of that system. That system exists today over the United States, over the entire world. It's typically north of 18,000 feet above ground. That's where the jets all fly. 
And that same logic can be done over a city. You can hypothetically, in your brain, split up the airspace over a town into little cubes. And then, and people have done this, um, assign these little pockets of air to individual vehicles that no one else can occupy. And as long as you do this, you're guaranteed not to collide with anybody else. It's amazing. And on the uh, congestion, uh, the, the worry there, the will crash into each other. You've uh, made the point, we don't realize how much space there are, uh, there is in space in the clouds. And uh, that 1.7 million versus uh, 64 cars in 1,000 uh, feet it is quite illustrative of that. So th those three myths go by the boards. Uh, what about practical things like uh, weather? We all know turbulence in aircraft. Uh, will the software, the software being developed where uh, we won't be able to fly if the wind turbulence is at a certain level? How, 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 how do we cope with the weather? These are all challenges that we've addressed and basically solved for commercial aviation. Uh, yes, thunderstorms, updrafts, icing, clouds, these are all technical challenges. In the field of eVTO, the field of what you call Steve, flying cars, is working through them right now, but they have proven technological solutions. Um, perhaps the most severe weather phenomenon that affects us regularly in the United States are thunderstorms, and those are terrible to fly into. They can break your plane apart. And what we've developed over the years is weather radar systems. They can track those thunderstorms very, very accurately, and we actually instruct commercial pilots to fly around them. You might not know this, but you're not going to fly through a thunderstorm. We can use the exact same technology for these e vehicle cars. In fact, thunderstorms are less violent close to the ground than they'd be up in, higher in the atmosphere. Hmm. And uh, then uh, there's the challenge of uh, air traffic control. You mentioned the FAA, but it is still highly inefficient. It's dependent on people. People can get tired. They have to talk to the pilots saying, uh, do this, hold that. And uh, if we're going to have all these millions of vehicles in the air, obviously that's got to be done uh, by software, not by uh, people in control towers trying to keep track of where we're going. Yeah, I mean, Steve, <laughs> Those of you really, really old might remember that in telephony, we used to have these switchboards and you want to dial somebody and you talk to a person and then you, you would plug little cables into switchboards. And of course, in the age of cell phone, that, that, that is not the case anymore. We now have, as you mentioned, billions of cell phones and you can drive with your car or your train from one cell phone tower to another, be handed over automatically without a person in the loop and you don't even notice it. You don't even know where the cell phone towers are anymore. It's so ubiquitous. That technology, I believe would easily apply to, to flight. The reason why we haven't done it yet is because we don't have hundreds of thousands or, or millions of these so-called flying cars. We only have a small number of jets. And for the current traffic, the voice-based routing is sufficient, but it's going to fall apart. We have to replace people with computers for routing decisions. And we've done it over and over again. There's no, no magic to it. It's just you have to computerize the communication to planes and take the human voice out of the loop.